Well, hello, and welcome back to the Fin to the Woods podcast with me, Finney and Hackett. We're back for another week of all the latest theatre news and reviews and gossip and drama, as always. I hope everyone in the UK is enjoying this slight bout of hot weather we've got going on. It's nice, but it's taken me by surprise. Now I'm quite sweaty all the time and it's not very fun. It's always quite muggy, but, you know... We, we manage, we deal with it. But also, this episode of the Fint of the Woods podcast is coming from a brand new location. I have relocated because I graduated from uni this past week from the Guildford School of Acting with a degree in theatre production, which I am very, very happy about. But I literally graduated and the following day I moved back home to the Sunshine Coast. So, yeah, we're no longer in Guildford. Bye bye, Guildford. Hello, the southeast. Let's crack on because there's a lot of news to get through this episode and let's start with an update on the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang saga that I spoke about last week. If you don't already know, the show has had to cancel two of its tour stops because the car got damaged in transit from Bromley to Milton Keynes a good few weeks ago now and the tour's still been postponed. However, they have announced that the tour will be reopening on Friday the 26th of July in Belfast in Northern Ireland. They've still had to cancel some more performances in Belfast that beginning of the week. I think Tuesday to Thursday they've had to cancel. But the show will be reopening on the Friday after all that drama. So I'm very glad for everyone involved that they'll finally be able to do this show again. It must feel like forever because when you're doing any kind of show or any kind of tour or West End production or even a local production, if a show gets cancelled or if you have to cancel a few performances, it must be so weird. It does feel weird. It's an odd experience. So to have weeks and weeks taken out of your contract in literally, they haven't really done that much of the tour. There's still so much to go. It must be a very odd feeling. But I guess it is also a paid holiday at the same time. So, you know. Right, moving on to a brand new piece of theatre which has been described as part choral work and part theatre piece. And it's called I Am Harvey Milk. And this is going to be the European premiere of the show this October at Cadogan Hall. The show is written by Andrew Lipper, music and lyrics by Andrew Lipper, most well known for his work on The Addams Family. That's probably his most successful piece and one that generally most people know him for. He wrote the music and lyrics to it and I didn't know who Harvey Milk was until I did research for this episode and he was the first openly gay man to run for public office in California and be elected to public office in California and he was assassinated not that long after that happened and his life story and what he did in his short lifespan is really interesting and it sounds like a very interesting thing to make a theatre piece about. So it's it's quite exciting, really. It sounds like a really interesting story. And it's going to star Joel Harper Jackson as Harvey Milk and also Sierra Boges, who is wonderful. I love both of them, actually. I saw Joel Harper Jackson in Cock um, after Taryn Edgerton had to pull out of that production with Jonathan Bailey. I was initially disappointed. I think a lot of people were. No offence to Joel Harper Jackson, but people got their tickets to go and see those two names in it. When I went, I saw Jonathan Bailey and Joel Harper Jackson and they were both fantastic and I was not disappointed at all. He was marvellous. And Sierra Boges, I've just watched many, many clips of her doing many things over the years. I really love her as a performer and an actress and also her on the Healy's in The Little Mermaid on Broadway. But that excites me, a new piece of theatre never seen in Europe before being premiered this October in London. Let's move up to Scotland for the next piece of theatre news, which I think is just absolutely brilliant in every way. So do you remember a few months back when there was that whole Willy Wonka experience in Glasgow that just was an absolute mess, was pure chaos? Well... Now that is being turned into a musical, well, a parody musical, which will premiere at the Edinburgh Fringe this year. And the casting is, I can't believe they've managed to do this, 
They have got two stars of the original film of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory alongside Gene Wilder to star in this production. So Julie Dawn Cole, who played Veruca Salt, will be appearing for a select amount of dates. And Paris Themen, who played Mike TV, will also be appearing for a select amount of dates. I just can't believe they've managed to get them to be in it. I won't believe it until I see it, because that is, it seems too good to be true, but it was in an article on what's on stage. So, you know, you've got to believe them. And it was on April 1st. So, you know, but I just think it's brilliant. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what it's like and what it's, all about. And across the UK next year there is going to be a new tour of the play The Girl on the Train and it's going to star Giovanna Fletcher. Now this show has toured the UK a few times. I saw it back in must have been 2019, 2018, 2019 and it was starring Samantha Womack or Samantha Janus if you're old and I don't remember much about it. I don't remember hating it. I don't remember loving it either. I think I enjoyed seeing her on stage. I enjoyed her performance. But I don't remember the storyline or the set or anything really grasping me. Maybe it's because I was too young to take it in. Maybe I need to see it again. But I don't remember much apart from the set and Samantha Womack drinking some alcohol. That was about it. And I remember, yeah, I don't know. I don't remember a lot about it. I will maybe have to go and see this new tour which starts in January 2025 with Giovanna Fletcher as the lead. They're busy, busy people, the Fletchers. She's doing that, and also Tom Fletcher's doing his new musical, I can't remember what it's called, not The Crankies, something along those lines, this Christmas as well. Also the Paddington musical I think he's involved in too. You know I like talking about theatre renovations and theatre investments and all that kind of thing, and there's been a few little updates this week. The first one is that the Chichester Festival Theatre a very well-respected regional venue here in the UK, will be getting a third performance space permanently, which is really exciting. They've previously had temporary venues when the Festival Theatre, the largest venue, was having renovations. They had a big tent, kind of like a circus tent called Theatre in the Park, where they did Barnum, which I saw and I absolutely loved. They've had a Spiegel tent. They've had a few pop-up venues, but this is the first time that a permanent venue will be built on the site. As I said, they have the Festival Theatre, the largest venue, the Minerva Theatre, which is slightly smaller, and now the Nest, which is an 120-seat Studio Thrust Theatre, which will be situated between the Festival Theatre and the big car park. The car park there is huge. It's hectic if you don't park in the right place if you're going to see a show. I'm going to see Oliver in a few weeks' time, so I'll let you know what the car parking was like. And also, of course, we'll give a review. But this is brilliant because I think Chichester is a really important venue and the whole point of this space is to support local talent and new writers and new artists and new, new technicians and who doesn't want that for a theatre community and at a venue as prestigious as the Chichester Festival Theatre. It's marvellous and I'm a big supporter of it. However, they need to raise quite a lot of money. They need to raise 1.5 million by March next year to get the theatre up and running in 2025. That's a big ask. I believe they've put forward, I think, 250,000 of their own money towards it to get the ball rolling, but that's still a long way to go. But hopefully they get some rich people who will want to invest in it and help nurture the next generation of talent in Chichester. Another fairly exciting piece of theatre news this week is about the Regent Theatre in Ipswich. So this theatre is 95 years old and it needs a bit of a refer, a bit of a touch-up. And this apparently is set to go ahead with a £3.5 million makeover. This is going to include refurbished toilets, improved accessibility, including a lift, which is amazing. Any old theatre, it's a struggle to get a lift put into any old building because of the way it was built. They weren't built to have lifts in, they weren't built with masses of space. Being able to do that is absolutely brilliant news and also a larger bar. Who doesn't want a larger bar? More alcohol, that sounds wonderful to me. But again, a brilliant thing for the community. Obviously it will mean the venue has to close for a bit, but it means that after that time it will be more accessible to more people and hopefully will run for another 95 years and more. 
Let's talk now about some legal drama that's been going on over the last week or more than a week, but has been spoken about in the last week. The first is about equity, and equity is taking legal action against Spotlight. So Spotlight is a subscription service for actors. It's used by many, many agents and casting directors and directors to find people they want for their shows. And I think there's about 90,000 members. It's insane. And without a Spotlight pin or a Spotlight code or a Spotlight profile, whatever it's wants to be called it is quite hard to get into rooms because it is the go-to for any director or casting director so equity are taking them to call over their subscription fee so as i said it's so vital to the industry yet they raised their subscription fee by nine percent which is quite a lot it was already quite expensive and there's already been many conversations around whether it should even have a fee when it's so vital to how the industry runs but they raised it by 9%. And Equity have stated that Spotlight subscriptions charged to its members are above what the law reasonably allows, and that Equity wants to see Spotlight use the same model as equivalent services in other sectors, whereas Spotlight are arguing or claiming that, that they're not an employment agency, so they are exempt from this law. So the whole point of this court case is going to be whether to determine whether Spotlight do class as an employment agency and therefore should be applying their subscription fees under that law or whether they are exempt from that and they can carry on charging ridiculous prices for a subscription to Spotlight. It will be very interesting to see how it pans out. A lot of people, I feel, are on equity side because why would anyone want the prices to go up on anything, especially something as important as Spotlight. So we'll see over the coming weeks and months how this case develops and hopefully the outcome will be a positive one for the industry. Also rearing its head again this week is all the investigation drama around Arts Ed. Arts Ed, if you don't know, is a very, very popular and successful drama school here in the UK, one of the biggest in the country. And there have been some very dramatic turn of events at the school over the last three, four years, if not longer. But the most recent thing that's happened is that the principal of art said Julie Spencer has stepped down following an investigation into misconduct at the school. Her professional relationship with employees has been damaged beyond repair, according to the investigation. So this has been ongoing for months. A few months back earlier on in the year, an investigation was done, I believe, by deadline into the school and the culture surrounding drama schools, but specifically arts ed and her behaviour towards students and staff was not nice. There were bullying claims, there were misconduct claims. It wasn't. It was a bit nasty. Then arts ed have had an outside investigation. And since that investigation started, Julie Spencer has been on sick leave this whole time. And now she has left. And the people who were doing the investigation said they couldn't get a well-rounded review of the principal's thoughts on anything because she was on sick leave. This is not the start of all this drama. And she actually isn't the first head of Art Said to leave in the last three years. Because back in 2021, Chris Hocking, who was head of Art Said, resigned after accusations of a cult-like and sexualised atmosphere and environment at the drama school. Again, not good. And the claims were not very nice at all. And some of the things that I heard that had been going on from different people, it was not nice. So when he left, Julie Spencer then took over and now she's also resigned. So it's just an absolute mess over there, really. And on top of that, Matt Bulmer, who was the previous head of the day school and the sixth form, is taking Art said to court for unfair dismissal after he raised concerns of a culture of fear in the school and a few months later he was let go. So it's not looking good for Art said at the moment. The school itself and the pupils are doing very well. They're in many West End shows. I know a few people who are doing marvellously. But the culture surrounding it is not good and what I hear I'm trying not to say anything that's going to get me in trouble but what I hear sometimes isn't great 
But I think that's the same with many drama schools. There's been many investigations, including some into where I went, to GSA, into certain situations that went on there. It's just, I think it's a really upsetting and unfortunate thing to learn and something that desperately needs addressing and has been, has needed to be addressed for a very long time. But it takes this large scale thing to happen to really get into the public eye and for people to notice it properly from outside those inner conversations within the theatre industry. So I'm hoping this means that things like this will start to be taken a lot more seriously and claims by members of staff and pupils will also be taken a lot more seriously and all these issues can be sorted out earlier on so then they don't develop into something more serious and more dangerous for the schools and for the pupils and the staff. Let's cross the pond to the USA and talk about the Emmy Awards, the biggest awards for television in the US. They honour many, many programmes of varying different types from reality to drama to comedy to everything in between. And of course, as ever, a host of Broadway stars were nominated. Cheryl Lee Ralph once again getting nominated for her performance in Abbott Elementary. Carol Burnett, who is 91, has been nominated for Best Supporting Actress in a comedy series for her performance in Palm Royale which if you haven't seen on Apple TV, you must watch it. I loved it. I mean, the ending is weird. I won't spoil it, but the ending is bizarre and made me question what the programme was actually about. But they are making a second series, so hopefully it will all be wrapped up. Dame Imelda Staunton got a nomination for Best Lead Actress in a Drama Series alongside Carrie Coon, who got a nomination for The Gilded Age. And I've spoken about The Gilded Age before and the fact it's full of Broadway stars. And this is the first Emmy season where they've really recognised the programme. Christine Baranski, a two-time Tony winner, I believe, has been nominated for Best Supporting Actress in a Drama Series for The Gilded Age and also the programme itself for the Drama Series category. The Tony Awards were also nominated in the live events category. It's just been a brilliant, brilliant time for all those Broadway performers. And I could sit here for literally hours and hours reading off who's been nominated. Pasek and Paul, the famed composers of Dear Evan Hansen and The Greatest Showman, have been nominated. Mark Shaman's been nominated. Just a really large selection of theatre people. And it's not a surprise. It happens every single year. There's a big collection of theatre stars who have done well at the Emmys, but it's always lovely to hear theatre people doing well outside of theatre, and those nominations celebrate that, but do go onto the Emmys website and look at all the nominees, because there are hundreds and hundreds, and I would be sat here all day going through them all. Leading on from last week's news of the full cast for Once Upon a Mattress, Cara Lindsay, who has starred in Wicked and Newsies on Broadway, will be the official standby for Sutton Foster in the part of Winifred. She did this when the show was at New York City Centre. I don't think she ever got to go on. Maybe she did a dress rehearsal, but I don't think she ever went to do, got to do a whole performance, but she will be standby for the production. I'm hoping they give her a few dates set. Maybe Sutton Foster's busy doing something else for a day or two, but I really do hope they give her a couple of performances because I always always think and always feel quite sad for the standbys who have learned the parts and just never go on. The understudies who learn these parts and never go on must be so disheartening all that time and effort and you never get to go on. I imagine you get paid a bit more so that maybe that counteracts the disappointment but still all that hard work so hopefully for Cara she gets to go on. At that New York City Centre production of Mattress, Cheyenne Jackson played Sir Harry, but when the cast was announced last week, he wasn't in it, but now we know why, because he is doing Le Cage alongside Kevin Cahoon at the Pasadena Playhouse. He will be marvellous in Le Cage. I didn't know much about this show, about the storyline. I knew a few of, I knew most of the songs, to be fair, but I didn't know a lot about the show until I saw it at the Regent's Park Open Air Theatre in London last year. I loved it. I got quite hot and sunburnt, if I remember rightly, but it was a brilliant show. So I can imagine Che and Jackson in it as well, and I think he will be brilliant. So unfortunate that he's not doing Mattress, but brilliant that he's doing Le Cage. 
Two previously announced Broadway transfers of some musicals have now announced their home and opening dates. So Boop, the Betty Boop musical, will be opening at the Broadhurst Theatre in April 2025. I spoke about this a few weeks ago and how excited I am for it and how it got brilliant reviews in Chicago. So hopefully it will do well on Broadway. And also Idina Menzel's new musical Redwood has also found its home at the Nederlander Theatre from January 2025. Again, lots of hype around this and Idina returning to Broadway in a new musical, which is always exciting. So yeah, two new shows have found their new homes. The US tour of the Tony-winning musical Kimberly Akimbo has announced its lead actress. So on Broadway, Victoria Clark played the role and won herself a Tony Award alongside Bonnie Milligan, who also won herself a Tony for Best Supporting Actress in a Musical. However, Victoria Clark will not be doing the tour, but Carolee Carmelo will. If you don't know who Carolee Carmelo is, she is a fabulous Broadway performer who is a favourite of many, many people. She's played every role you can imagine. She played Kate in Kiss Me Kate. She's played Donna in Mamma Mia, I believe. She's played, oh, she was in Bad Cinderella, or whatever it was called on Broadway. You know, it was called Bad Cinderella on Broadway, but only Cinderella over here. But she was in that. She was in 1776 recently. She doesn't stop working. She also led the US tour of Hello, Dolly. But now she will be leading the US tour of Kimberly Akimbo from later on this year. And I think she will be marvellous as ever. Get ready because Patti Lapone is releasing a new album. So this is based on her concert, A Life in Notes, which is coming to the Coliseum in London next year. And it's being released this week. It's a studio recording of the concert act and features a few of her well-known hits from shows like Avita and Company. But also some new stuff that I've never heard her sing before. And I imagine maybe a few bits of spoken dialogue as well, I'm hoping for anyway. But I believe it's being released this week, which is really sudden and exciting because... Often when a cast recording of a show is released or a concert, they big it up, you have months to wait, you have to pre-order it. This is out this week on digital streaming. Who doesn't want more Patti Lapone in their lives? I certainly do, always. And a little bit of news that went, I think, a bit under the radar this week is the announcement that the new musical based on Muhammad Ali's life, called Ali, will premiere in Chicago next year prior to a Broadway run. So the production team for this is absolutely stacked, featuring people involved in the Bob Marley musical, MJ the musical, and I think it's going to be a really good show just from the creative team alone. It's also a very interesting story. He had a very interesting career and a very interesting life. So I think it will make for an interesting subject matter to turn into a musical. Whether it will translate well into a musical is a whole nother matter. But yeah, I don't see much buzz about this this week. I think because it was previously announced earlier this year or last year that it was going to premiere somewhere else and then it all went a bit quiet. But now it's premiering in Chicago and we can all get a bit excited about it. I certainly am. It sounds really interesting. It wouldn't be an episode of the Fin to the Woods podcast without talking about a concert production of a show because they are announced all the time. And this week's was Ghost. So this concert production of Ghost will be at the Adelphi Theatre on October 1st and it's going to be led by Oliver Thompson and Lucy Jones. Right, so brilliant idea to do Ghost as a concert version but I think it's really weird and a pretty bad idea to do it while the show is on tour because the tour of the show opens I think in August or September this year and it's touring till the following June or July And they are doing a concert version of the show while the show is on tour. Surely you'd rather people spend their money on going to see it at their local theatres and up and down the country rather than heading to the West End for just a one night only concert. It's using the same branding, the same logo, everything. I think it's a really odd move and an interesting one. And I don't know if people have gone to see it on tour, whether they will be bothered to go and see it in the West End and vice versa. An interesting choice to do it while the show is on its first UK tour in quite a few years. Hmm. 
Let's round off with a bit of casting news as ever. The first one I want to talk about is the Steps musical, which has announced its lead casting. Here and Now is going to open in November in Birmingham, and it's set in a seaside supermarket. That is so camp. And it's going to be led by Rebecca Locke, Heba El Sheik, Charlene Hector, and Blake Patrick Anderson, with further casting to be announced at a later date. I am so excited for this and cannot wait for it. Also, a new cast for Matilda has been announced, who will start performances on the 10th of September. This includes Tiffany Graves, Neil McDermott and Eve Norris as Mrs and Mr Wormwood and Miss Honey, respectively. Again, I haven't seen Matilda must be in about six, seven years now. I've seen it twice, though. So maybe it's time for me to return. It's a great show and it's now in its 13th year, which is absolutely crazy that... It's been running that long. Brilliant. But I always think any show that runs over five years, you must be, the producers and everyone involved must just be so happy that it's doing so extremely well. So big up everyone at Matilda who are doing a marvellous job. And also the another premiere in Birmingham, Becoming Nancy, the Stars and Drew musical directed by Jerry Mitchell, has also announced its lead casting, Joseph Peacock, Genevieve Nicole, Rebecca Traherne and Matthew Craig will lead this musical which premieres in October at the Birmingham Rep. Again, another show I'm very excited about. I love Styles and Drew as composers and I, I've maybe I need to make a trip to Birmingham at the end of this year in October and November, maybe in the middle of that over Halloween to go and see these two new very exciting and probably quite camp musicals. Time for the Fint of the Woods vaguely fun fact to round off the episode. And of course, it's going to be about the Emmy Awards and Angela Lansbury. They did not get on. Angela Lansbury was nominated for 18 Emmy Awards across her career and won zero. And most of those were from Murder, She Wrote. She was nominated for 12 Emmys for Murder, She Wrote, which is insane. Every season consecutively, which hasn't been done, I don't think, since then. She's iconic. I love her. But she never won. The poor woman never won an Emmy Award across her whole career. She's in the Television Academy Hall of Fame who run the Emmys. And she also hosted the awards in 1993. But she never won an Emmy. Poor Angela. Thank you once again for listening to this week's episode of the Fin to the Woods podcast. Please do share with your friends and family. Give me a rating. Email me at fintothewoods at gmail.com if you have anything you want featured or for me to speak about. But yes, I will speak to you once more next week. Music